Hey, welcome to Lead Full. My name is Chesley Lunday. I am your host today. Here's the deal. We know that life, no matter how successful you are, can sometimes be an exercise in futility. And we want to help you defeat futility in your lives. We want to help you develop fulfillment and we want to help you change the world because we know this, when leaders are fulfilled, they fill the world with hope. Now, let's get ready to lead full. All right, I got Steve Pike in the house. Uh, What people don't know, I mean, this is the second time you and I've gotten to talk, but we basically lived in the same neighborhood, didn't even know it. We did. Yeah. Springfield, Missouri. Springfield, Missouri. I was in college. You were... uh, you were basically running the church plant division of the denomination that uh, owned the college I was going to, you know, (laughs) so, um, yeah, rest in peace, you know, Central Bible College. (laughs) Um, And then that's uh, true. That's a whole story in itself. Oh, I'm sure I would love to know the inner details because I know a lot of my friends are not happy still after all these years. So uh, that would be interesting to another conversation for another day. But yeah. yeah. So Steve, you uh, were, you're the guy that started Church Multiplication Network in uh, yeah. in Springfield, basically. Well, yeah, me and I, I was the catalyst. I was the, the guy that brought it all together. But man, we had such a great uh, br- coming together of a lot of really uh, amazing people. So um, uh, yeah, I, I was the catalyst, but but a lot of people helped. (laughs) That's cool. All right. So I'm just going to give you a rundown. I love to talk to, uh, young professional leaders, um, that aren't necessarily in church leadership, but my whole goal is to help them reimagine leadership and church, uh, and what impact looks like reimagine work. And so, especially from the Christ following, um, aspect. And I, I, I feel like this, um, I, you know, I try to do a business and a creative uh, interview, but church is sneaking in because I'm finding that there is a need for another way of thinking about following Jesus in the 21st century. Mm. Fortunately for us, you might have written the manual called Next Wave. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, I've been reading through it. You talk about what, 12 shifts that the church has to make to be, uh, to be relevant and impactful in the 21st century. And man, I would like to, we don't have time to hit all of them, but I would like to hit a couple (laughs) of them that I think are super important. Um, the first one, I want to hit shift one from building the institution to catalyzing a movement. What does that mean? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, Well, um, yeah, if, yeah, if you, you kind of, so the part of the way that I framed the book was sort of really contrasting the 20th century view of all the ships and the first one being re- rediscovering the church um, to 21st century. And, and what's happened is this, there's been this big, it's, it, it's always happening. Culture is always evolving and moving forward and stuff like that. But maybe more dramatically and more significantly in this last shift from 20th century to 21st than perhaps ever. I mean, it's the pace of societal change has increased so quickly that we're living in unprecedented times. So um, what's interesting about this is I believe that the 21st century world kind of resembles more the first century than it does the 20th century. And um, so when you go back to when, when Jesus, God became flesh and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus, and he started his church, set it in motion, um, he said, uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And what he set in motion was a, was a movement. Uh, he, he told his disciples to go make disciples. He didn't tell them to go start churches. And what, what, but what always happens when people get together and, you know, start uh, doing stuff together. They they start to get organized and and eventually they they institutionalize, which is actually a good thing. I'm not I'm not saying institution is bad, 
but when institution becomes the point when institution becomes the the goal then that starts to it it starts to drift away from the movement that jesus set in motion the mission of making disciples and so uh what i mean by you know transitioning from I, I'm saying let's move away from focusing on institutions. So a lot of people in the 20th century, we were starting churches and what we thought about was, okay, we need, you know, we need a building, we need some pews, we need some, you know, sound systems and we need a pastor and we need staff. And we, and so all, all of a sudden, you know, the, when a person was thinking about starting a church, they were focusing on getting that stuff together so they could have quote unquote, a real church. And, I'm suggesting in the book that maybe we need to kind of go back to a more simple way of thinking about the church to where the goal is to make disciples. The purpose is to make disciples. And yeah, we need some organization around that, but let's keep the main thing, the main thing. Uh, I know a lot of my friends love what you just said. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I I have been working in a church for a decade, so all my friends that are in church with me might not might not because that's where they get their paycheck. But all my friends in well, business or yeah. you know actual leaders out in the marketplace that's that's music to their ears. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's you know honestly, I don't really care whether people like it or not. I just think it's the way it should be. You know, and uh, to your point, I mean, yeah, there, there's. That might sound threatening to, I mean, I, I have been a vocational church leader all my life. So I got my paycheck from the church and what I'm talking about could sound threatening to the church. Um, if you just think about it purely as your security is in the stability of the institution, but if your security is in being with Jesus on his mission, then this is really a freeing idea because, uh, now, now you can. Again, there's organization and there's institutional elements will always be part of it because that's what happens when people get together and and it has to, it needs to, but those have to, you know, be in the right order. (laughs) Yeah. So So when I, when I hear you talking, I, I, I hear this, there's this difference between organization and institutionalization, right? So yeah. Yeah. Well, the institution, again, the institutionalization, like if you, so, I mean, it's a whole big side discussion sort of but you know every every time an organization forms it has a life cycle whether it's a business or a church or you know whatever a 4-h club you know i don't whatever it and the cycle is you know it's it's this predictable they call it the sigmoidal curve and there's the the startup moment where somebody or maybe a group of somebody's catalyze an idea and say, hey, what if this happened, you know, and they're describing something that's out there in the future that doesn't exist right now, and maybe even feels impossible. But they rally together and they say, hey, let's make this happen. And, and, and then at some point in the future, after going through the first part of the curve, which is actually down, every time you try to start something, you run into obstacles and stuff, and you think this isn't going to happen, and da, da 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 But then you get through that, and then you get into this sweet spot where things are moving in the right direction, and you start to go, wait a minute, we're going to, we're, this is going to become a reality. And at some point in the future, you hit that, that goal, that thing that you were talking about, that you're dreaming about together back at the beginning of the curve. And then what happens without intervention, every organization goes into kind of a plateau. It's like you hit this equilibrium where everything's clicking and everything's great. And you've, you're living the dream, so to speak. And then you sort of plateau because there's nothing pulling you further and so you you know it's you you sort of hit this rest thing and then eventually you're going to start going down the other side of the curve into decline and eventually death and so every organization follows that pattern without intervention um and and so the problem is if you if you sort of accept that is i'm just gonna that's okay with me that's when institution becomes toxic to the mission of the organization, because then you just, you, when you get into that plateau, then you have a lot of motivation to just preserve status quo, which means you're, you're becoming less and less relevant. And eventually you're going to drop off the, the curve into irrelevance. And, and, and when that happens for a church, it's tragic. It happens for anything. It's tragic, but 
um, that that's that's what um, so organization is necessary institution for, for the, the sake, sake of institution, institution is, is toxic. toxic so yeah so institution for the sake of institution ends up on the second half of that curve and uh, yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And, that's, and that's so what so you what have you to do is you have to start, start a new curve, curve. you yeah. have to look, look at, at each other and go, and go Okay. okay. Hey, this, this is, is great. great. This, this is, is awesome. awesome. But where, where are we, we supposed, supposed to go now? What are yeah, we supposed we gotta to do now? We got to infuse new vision and a new preferable yeah. future into the life of that organization. Exactly. Which is really harder than it sounds because again, you've got this content. It's like, oh no, people feel like, oh man, I just, we're resting. We're happy. Why screw it up? You know? And so you actually have to intervene and honestly, when you start the new curve, you're going to go back down again, which is scary for a leader. You know, you go back into, oh, holy crap, we don't know what we're doing. And, um, and, and you, you know, you're taking risks again, and there's no guarantee you're going to hit that next thing. So you put yourself deliberately back into a position that, um, it, you know, it, it makes you, it makes you not happy. So, so the thing, the thing about, you know, making disciples, if, if you keep that, that's like, that is, that is the, uh, micro, the, the granular activity of the church that if you keep that at the center, it'll help keep pushing you forward because you're always thinking about, okay, who's next, who, who, who can we make a disciple of now? And so it's sort of, naturally helps the church or again if you apply it in business i mean you're always looking for new customers um you're you're not going to gain new customers if you just keep making the same thing and you know you're not responding to technology or technological developments or whatever you're just making the same old thing eventually you'll have no customers you know so uh i hear uh les McEwen's predictable success um, I don't know if you've read that book. Haven't, um, I haven't read really. it. No. So Les McEwen is a uh, business consultant built and managed uh, 34 plus odd businesses. He's in his sixties now. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a, uh, I think he's Irish, Irish, uh-huh. so, uh, I... either, either <laughs> Irish or Scottish. I can't remember, but yeah, he's, he's done a lot of work and he talks about the organizational cycle and, uh, in business, yeah. he talks about the health piece being predictable success. Yeah. And he talks about early struggle and then fun. And then this whitewater thing that happens as you transition from fun to being a predictable, successful, predictably successful company. Yeah. And uh, there's there's a yeah. shift in that happen, which goes, um, we have to insert processes um, from just vision and getting stuff done. And so then... Right, that, right. The process, vision, and operation side is what creates a synergy between the three is what creates right. predictable success. Um, but in the church world, so we've got this like five, uh, these five g- ministry gifts, if you would, you would call that, um, yeah, yeah. that yeah, help yeah. the organization of the church. You got apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Uh, the yep, yep. the uh, American church has really um <laughs> really cornered the market on pastor and teacher in fact yeah, if you're not yeah, if yeah. you're not a church uh if you're not a church uh leader you might not have even heard of yeah, apostle yeah. or prophet you might have heard prophet right, from right. like stories you know but not a, right, not right. from a a modern day perspective um could right, you right. maybe go in a little bit to like how how those pieces yeah, yeah. work for the pushing uh out of uh, the church. Yeah. Yeah. That is really, uh, that it, it's, it's actually incredible that, that, you know, that, that whole idea was, was, was really introduced way back, you know, in, in the, you know, 2000 years ago, and it is so powerful and it has so many applications. So, you know, you have your five, your five things, which is apostle, um, Alan Hirsch calls them a pest, which I think I is think kind, of kind of a funny. funny. Uh, yeah. And, 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 Peyton and, Jones and, and, calls uh, it fist it, leadership. Cause he talks about each one of the fingers being on it. Okay. And it's like, Hey, yeah, he, he's more, he's more our, our style comic book. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, lingo is a little bit better. Sorry, Alan, you're a yeah, little yeah, older yeah. than, uh, than Peyton is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. 
so anyway, so you you know the the apostle is is the catalyst kind of a person. It's the person who sees what could be yeah almost and like a sp- really spiritual entrepreneur if you will right? yeah yeah and and call yes and calls people yeah it's it's somebody who yeah it's i think a big piece of the ap- of apostolic deal is it's just it's a person who's discontent with status quo and also is is adept at seeing opportunities um that could be so for the church, that means the apostle is going like Paul, you know, he's kind of in the, in the Bible, he's the, uh, the most, um, uh, well, he wrote a good part of the new Testament. Anyway, at one point he goes, I've pretty much done everything I can do here. I need to go to Spain. And Spain was like the, the barbarians of the world at that point, it was the scary undeveloped part of the world. And he's like, I want to go there, you know? So that's the apostles. Like, I want to go to this scary place whatever that may be. It's also like the apostle to say, I'm done here when he had only planted like uh, three churches of like 12 people. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Because Because he understood understood what he did. did. Set something something in motion. motion. Yeah. That's 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 good. I'm good. Yeah. 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 So so, I've already got the movement going. I don't need to stay here. And, you know, in fact, apostles probably uh, don't like hanging around. Uh, They hate the institution because it's boring to them. It's like, Hey, let's go start something new. So that's the apostle. And, you know, every organization needs that voice to keep them from getting stuck because uh, maybe jumping to the other end of the spectrum, you have like the teachers or the the, the pastors and, you know, the teacher is the person who's, you know, injecting knowledge and and ideas and wisdom and and they're they're learning from everything and then turning it into, um, you know, the seminars and sermons and whatever. And then the pastor, that gifting is is the person who brings the care, the, you know, like, I want to help you grow in your faith in Christ. And I want to, you know, walk you through the challenges of, of your your life. And um, and so those there's actually this kind of tension between apostles and those, you know, the pastors and, and the teachers, because. Um, you know, they're, the pastors and teachers want everything to just kind of be calm and, you know, peaceful. And they're working on these projects with people and they're teaching them and, and they just, they want stability. And so there's this, there's this tension and, and, and it's a good tension because obviously if, if all we're doing is running around chasing after the next great thing, we're going to get, uh, you know, way out of balance and, and people are going to get run over and chewed up and spit out and stuff like that. So that's why. But then you have you have the prophets and the evangelists and, um, you know, the prophets are those truth tellers. They're the people who go, wait a minute, <laughs> can't everybody see this really messed up thing about whatever's going on or whatever. Pro- so prophets are, are, are the truth tellers, the truth speakers, the proclaimers, they, they say what needs to be said. And they often, you know, actually irritate everybody around them because they're, they're saying out loud what people are thinking, but are afraid to say that kind of stuff. And, and, and again, you can see the value uh, for a robust organization to have that voice uh, they're kind of like the protesters and the demonstrators uh, of the church or the business or whatever that are just not they're, 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 they have this pure burning passion to to make truth uh, obvious, obvious to everybody. To everybody. And then so the they're helping. Are the, the, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, well, I was just oh, going to say, the, say the, the, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, they're, helping. they're helping. What were you? What were you? I was thinking uh, they're they're the prophet is like recalibrating the church, right? So they're always recalibrating yeah, yeah. back back to true north, right, right. And so right, if we right, would exactly. take that as a like, gift. Wait, that's we're, super we're, important. So we're not going off the rails. Exactly, exactly. Yes, that's right. Yes, and then the evangelist is that person who's like completely discontent. Um, they're they're more. I I would say the apostle is more focused on like the big picture. And the evangelist is more focused on people, on individuals, and thinking about, you know, how, who's missing, uh, who, who, in our world around us, in our, in our neighborhood, in our, in our city, in our community, whatever, who, 
who are the people that are, are not, not yet following Jesus and how can we help them meet Jesus? And again, maybe the evangelist could be in the, in the business world analogous to maybe a salesperson, you know, who's like, all right, who, who hasn't, you know, who hasn't bought this yet? You know, who needs to know about these? I heard about, you know, the shoe salesman, they, they both went to the, and it, so here's the, the, the evangelist is the person who has this, this picture that there's two shoe salesmen. They go to, they're sent to this region by their company. And one of them writes back and goes, man, this is and their shoe salesman. And one of them writes back and says, you know what? The, the, nobody wears shoes here. So it's impossible to sell shoes here because nobody wears shoes here. And the other guy writes back, Hey, this is awesome. Thank you for sending me here because nobody wears shoes. Everybody needs them, you know, and, and the evangelist has that perspective. It's like, everybody needs what we've got. And, and so this, you, you put those five things together and it's this really cool sort of balance of intention between all those different things. And that's the beauty of God's church. And there's probably some application to just about every sphere of, of um, organizational structure and leadership. Yeah. So there's no locus of power in any one of them. Right. So whereas in a business right. world, you have the CEO that's basically obviously you have the board above them, but the CEO usually calls the shots with this right. model. You're not talking about a, uh, you're really not talking about someone is in charge. Really? Right. 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 Well, they, well, they, yeah, they, yeah, they, they, they uh, uh, in fact, I, I've actually worked with a number of churches that have organized themselves around that. You know, they've realized, wait, we've got people that are naturally wired to sort of be the, the apostle and the prophet and whatever. And, and they, they lead as a team and no, there, there's no decision made, uh, unilaterally by one there, there isn't like, the buck stops with this person. It start. It stops with this group of people, and they bring their perspectives, and they argue, and they fight, and they, you know, uh, they advocate for their perspective, and then collectively they agree. Okay, this is what we're going to do next. You know, and that's a pretty powerful thing. And and you you know you do see that. Um, uh, that the, there's this. It, it's. It's not as explicit as I wish it was, but maybe it's on purpose that we have to kind of figure out how to make this work. But in the New Testament, you see these hints of, you know, Paul interacting with other people, and he's a pretty type A kind of a guy, but um, you see him letting those other voices come into the mix and motivate and, and care about what's going on. So anyway, it's a good, 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 uh, good point. Good point. Yeah. Um, let's go to shift three, because uh, this is one of the other questions that I think uh, um, leaders that are outside of the church, uh, they're, they're asking, they're wondering what churches are doing about this uh, for, for a variety, variety of reasons, which is reinvent funding from self-sustaining to sustainable. So what does it look like for the future church uh, with funding? I guess you're saying there's a movement away from the whole tithing perspective? Well, I think there needs to be. Um, and the, the, the way that this really became clear to me was, you know, I, when I was leading CMN, uh, the, the church organ, church planning organization, uh, we, uh, you know, the, the, the prevailing model of starting churches was based on a, a a fund a funding strategy that basically the idea was you you really need to find a bunch of people who know how to tithe well, well let me back up one step and say for a long time uh, in in the 20th century especially and honestly this is actually kind of a new idea people don't realize this but the the idea developed and it was called this among missiologists they 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 started touting this idea of the three self church self-sustaining self-funding self-propagating and that was considered to be like when is the church so it, it was uh, developed by missionaries who were saying you know it's not actually good that we go to another country and then we support the church there with with offerings from america or wherever the missionaries are being sent from that church needs to become self-sustaining self 
propagating and, and self-governing, and, and that's the way it should be. So that has been touted as like the ultimate. And so this idea of self-sustaining really kind of the, the, the concept got reduced to that means the tithes of the people who benefit from the ministry of the church are adequate to sustain the operational costs of the church and pay the salaries, et cetera, et cetera. And so this idea became strongly embedded in the 20th century church. And so every time we started a church, we were thinking we got to, you know, to do, to, for this church to be viable, we've got to find people who can, who are tithers and, and you've got to have like this critical mass and and that number sort of became 200 sort of that was the the the, the target for most church planners were told hey if you get 200 people there's going to be enough money flowing from that to you know pay the average operating costs of and so everybody was trying to launch quote unquote launch with 200 people and and it was you know like a quick start model of let's get 200 people together that all are tithing and then you know your your family's going to be fed the bills are going to be paid whether it's paying the mortgage or the rent and the operational costs of the church are going to be covered by that tithe and offering thing well when i started when i started thinking about what well, i started noticing the church wasn't going a lot of places because that model didn't work there uh, you can't go into a city neighborhood and find 200 people and gather them in six months or less and have their tithe be adequate. Most of them are, you know, uh, well, anyway, the, the point is, it's just it's just not a viable model in many places, including urban communities and rural communities. And so the church ended up really focusing most of its church planning efforts or church new churches were starting in the suburban settings where there was a higher concentration of people who already had they had a church background and they you know tithing didn't sound like um, something crazy to them and so you know it was relatively it's actually pretty it's still pretty realistic in many suburban settings to find enough people who are willing to join together and support the church so anyway uh, what I realized man that is actually hindering the church from going to many of the places where it's needed the most like how do you start a church where nobody's wanting a church and and people don't have a background you know and and so we either say well we just don't do that we're just going to only start the church where everybody's like please come and you know throwing buckets of money at us that doesn't make sense it, it's it's not it's not how god works you know he's he's going after people who who don't yet follow him so anyway so so I started looking at that and realized, man, that's got to change. And so when I say from self-sustaining, that, that self-sustaining is actually a sort of a code word in the missi missiology that refers to a church supported solely uh, on the tithes and offerings of the people that are benefiting from the ministry of that church. Sustainable is sounds like the same thing, but it's, it's really my, my de label for a church that is for the, the existence of a community of believers or disciples who are following Jesus together. And it is sustainable. It's the person, the people leading it are able to be there. They're able to afford to live in the community. The operations of the church are all covered there there's not a high degree of financial stress because they have a plan and basically what i'm saying in the book is that plan needs to be a just like when you invest you have a diversified portfolio of you know investments you don't buy you don't put all your money into one thing you diversify it so that as things go well the same idea is we we want to have instead of having all our money or all of our revenue coming from one channel which is the tithe channel we need to open up other channels that uh, allow the church to be sustainable through the ups and downs and the thick, you know, and, and it takes the pressure off of, we got to find people who know how to tithe. So it allows us to be more missionally focused on what are we here for? And we're not, you know, we're not having a conversation with somebody with in a back of our mind thinking, oh, good, this person knows how to tithe. So I want them to come to my church versus well, this this person isn't going to tithe for at least a decade. Um, so why should I spend time with them, you know?
I'm interrupting this amazing interview because I want to tell you about something really quickly. I want to tell you about Followers Made. A lot of us have been in church for a very long time and yet we are, you know, we have problems because we don't exactly know what it means to follow Jesus and it's not actually sitting in a pew or sitting in a seat listening to a preacher. It's actually developing the gifts and call that God has on our lives and also developing intimacy with Jesus. Now dudes, I know that word intimacy seems a little weird, but give it a chance. We want to help you develop your relationship with Jesus and develop the call of God that is on your life. And so we would love for you to text 480-531-9015 and do this for me. Text hello to 480-531-9015. I'm going to get back to you and we would love to set up a time to show you what that system followers made looks like and how we might help you uh, follow Jesus better in your context. Now back to the interview. <laughs> it, it also, from a, from an outsider perspective, a, a lot of my friends that have talked about this, they're like, hey, the church only wants my money. But if you're right, put in right, a position right, right. where you have to pay a mortgage and you're yep, using yep. the building, like it's only fair to go, hey, can you help support this? Because we don't make any money without giving. So, uh, but what we've done is we put a, theological construct around it, you know, and, right, right, uh, right, and right. then said, Hey, this is, this is important for you to do that. And not that, you know, obviously generosity is important and it's good, but yeah, yeah. Well, now well, that's, we're looking at different options. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it tithe only philosophy or, or strategy for funding a church creates a whole bunch of, of missiological problems, because like you just said, um, you know uh, the the idea that if if all the if, if the only way you can pay for the building comes from tithes, then you're motivated to figure out a way to explain to people why they need to pay for this building. And here's then on top of that, so you got business people who have properties, and they what they want to do is optimize the use of that property. So for them to own a piece of property that sits empty 90% of the time is unthinkable, you know? And so, but then they, but then they come to, to this church building and the, and the pastor's like, Hey man, you need to put money in the office so you can afford this building. And they're going, so we can well, hang I'm out only one day a week. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm, I'm here I'm for here 45, 45 minutes every, every week. week. What else yeah. is going on? Well, which is shift like number five, office. right? Which is what we're getting into yeah, the redeeming yeah. architecture, which is where I want to go because I think the future of the physical church building, a lot of people have been talking digital lately. I love digital. I'm a yeah, digital yeah. church planter. I think the, yeah, uh, yeah. I think the future is hybrid, but you're about yeah, taught yeah. you're what you're re ready to get into is like redeeming architecture. And I think yeah, this is yeah. a fascinating subject. Some things that I've been talking about with uh, other people to how do we utilize yeah, this yeah. monstrosity of an, a building seven days a week? instead of just yeah, one. Yeah. And so could you, could you, obviously you are already going there, but I would love to dig into that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I remember when I was a kid, I guess we actually lived about a block away from the church that we attended. And I was, a, I had a newspaper route, you know, I was a little entrepreneur guy, you know, making money. And, uh, and so my route, on my bike, you know, I've got my bag full of newspapers and I'm delivering them to people. And I, and I, I had to go by the church building. And I also, I play the piano and, you know, they had this big grand piano in the sanctuary of this, of this church. And, you know, usually somebody was there, the secretary or somebody was there and I'd go into this building and say, Hey, can I play the piano? And I go in there and I pretend like I'm in Carnegie hall or something like that. But anyway, I remember, I remember sitting, being in that big empty room and every day, uh, and thinking, man, we're only here. Of course, back in the day, the quote unquote normal church, you went Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday night. So so at least at least we were using the building three times a week instead of once a week, you know. And uh, but I but I remember thinking, why? This is crazy. This is big because they had to heat it to keep, you know, the pipes from freezing and stuff. So they're spending all this money for this building that's empty most of the time. So I remember even then it was it was ironic to me. Um, and so 
you know, one of the, and, and that's part of the institutionalization of the church is we started thinking it has to be a building um, and we have to own it and all that kind of stuff. So um, when I talk about redeeming the architecture of the church is uh, really, you know, people say it all the time, the church is the people, but then we really, we actually call the building the church. You know, we say it's, we, we look at this building, we say, that's the church. That's really not actually true. That is a building where the church meets, you know, and, and it sounds like I'm splitting hairs, but it's really a big deal is if you find yourself referring to a building as a church, you, you don't understand what the church actually is. It really is the people of God gathered together for a purpose. Ecclesia, the called out ones, people called out for a purpose. That is the church. That's what Jesus is building. Now, do we need a place to meet? Well, that that's that, that's the question and and how you know what does that place need to look like and and all that kind of stuff and so once you once you disconnect yourself from feeling like we have to have a building that is identified as the church for the church to be real and realize the church is real whether we have a building or not then you have the flexibility of recognizing wait a minute there's a whole lot of opportunities so like my friend Ralph Moore um, has this church. I remember, you know, he, he led this church in Hawaii for 20 years and for 20 years. And I mean, it went beyond that. But for the first 20 years of the church, they met in a, uh, 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 a cafeteria of a grade school and they grew the church to 2000. And the only way they could do that was they had like six or seven services back to back to back on the weekends in that same little tiny space. It would seat about, you know, three to 400 people. And so they did it five or six times and they just like kept ro rotating them out. But the point is they, so the church was, they, they didn't, and they, they had a relationship with that school. Um, and they finally, they, he just, they got tired of having to, you know, do all the setup and tear down. And he thought, you know, let's try to find a place to have a more permanent place and a bigger space so we, we can we can have more people. So they ended up, it's Hawaii, so land is pretty scarce there. Um, and they couldn't find land they could afford anywhere. So they finally made a deal with the Catholic Church to lease property for 30 years to build a permanent building on. And somebody said to him, Ralph, what are you going to do um, in 30 years? And he goes, I don't know. I'm probably going to be dead in 30 years. He said, uh, it's not, he, he said, it, that's for them to have faith. Uh, and, and, and so, so many times we, we flip it around, we go, oh, we need to build this building that will be a legacy for our children. You know, well, your children don't want your stupid building, you know, 30 years in the future. It's, it's out of date. It needs new wiring. Yeah. It's, it doesn't even serve the purpose. And so we've been building these one purpose buildings and stuff like that. And uh, so once you start realizing it really, the church really is the people, then you're free to just say, well, wait a minute. It's actually not necessarily bad to have a building if you use it well. And so what's happening now is many churches are beginning to say, wait a minute, how can we optimize this? How can we, how can we actually, you know, one option is, use the building um, as a revenue generator, uh, you know, uh, for, you know, you, you, there's co-working space, you, you can have little businesses and stuff in buildings. I mean, you've got to consult with lawyers and make sure you're doing things properly, setting it up so you're, you're not um, going to get yourself in trouble, but it can be done. Um, none of this is easy, but it can be done. So, you know, you have coffee shop churches, you have, but the other thing Ralph planted in my brain was the idea that the architecture of the church is not limited to what the church owns, but it can also be, you, you think of all the people that are part of the church that own homes and own property themselves and own businesses and stuff. And, and those people, you know, it, there's that passage in Acts where it says they had everything in common. And I don't think everything in common means that they all co-owned everybody's property. Right. It just, it, what it what it meant was that they viewed what they had as something as as a tool to be used for God's kingdom, you know, and and so you know that all of a sudden it's like, well, we don't really need to build class space. We can just you know get in a circle at Johnny's house, you know, or whatever, because that's part of the architecture of the church. And all of a sudden, the architecture of the church becomes everybody's house and everybody's 
you know, warehouse or whatever, everybody's business. And then, oh yeah, and by the way, maybe we do have this, this place we own in common or we rent in common, but, you know, uh, nowadays churches uh, are, are doing things like, you know, deliberately buying storefront property, not to have their worship gatherings there necessarily, but to have a, a place in the community, like a third place where people can gather for co-working or drinking coffee or whatever. I mean, there's just now that just blows open the way we think about it. And, and instead of church buildings sitting empty most of the time, now they become either fully utilized assets or the the church has this uh, dynamic way of thinking about all of the property that they they collectively own through the different individuals as possible resources for them as a community to serve the mission of Jesus, which Jesus, is to make, which disciples. make disciples. Yeah. Yeah. So I, as you're talking about this, um, I believe that we have a, a beautiful opportunity with our buildings to really um, have an open door into the city that you live in. Um like partnering Absolutely. with, like I'm thinking, so I live in Glendale, Arizona. Like what could we do with our building to help the city of Glendale and really right, building right. partnerships with the city and say, Hey, Absolutely. this isn't for us anymore. You know, and right. I've, I've even toyed with the idea, you know, um, and, uh, if, if CCC, if you are listening, I love you. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, like what would it look like in the future if we changed the name of the building away from our church name and into a name that is like for like you know something generic like the city hub you know so that people could come to yeah, that yeah, building yeah, yeah. and not have the uh, idea of this is a church um no this right, is for right. us you know so you could have a right, coffee right. shop in there because people love coffee you know but we have a gym we have right, right. so um right. what can we do to partner with the city yeah to yeah. Those really are, those help are... and be a part of the ecosystem which is shift number six right yeah yeah, yeah. which is yeah. reclaim yeah. the right, ecosystem right. Yeah, yeah, recognizing, recognizing you're part, you're of, something part of something bigger. Yeah, you're, yeah you're, what you just talked. I, 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 uh, I, uh, I got to tell, gotta you, tell you this great story. story. There was there, there was this church in a in a rural community in Colorado that um, somebody donated 200 acres to this church, and you know, so this is a small town. You know, uh, 200 acres sounds like something a mega church might have on the on the perimeter of a big city, and you know, build this big Disneyland campus or something. You know. But but 200 acres for a town of like 5,000 people or something in a, in a church at that time of maybe a couple of hundred people was, man, they had this big land. And, and so they were thinking about what can we do with this? And they realized this city, this little town does not have a city park. There's just not a place for people to go and with picnic tables and barbecue you know, pits and uh, whatever, volleyball. Uh, places, you know, that the stuff you have in a park, there's, there's, they don't have that. And, and so they built a, a park for the city on that 200 acres with walking paths and, you know, all the playground equipment, all this kind of stuff. And just exactly what you said, that we're doing this for the city. Well, it, the, the benefit, again, there's a side, the benefit is it also creates a place for people to gather. It, play, it creates a place for the church to interact with the people of the community in a, in an environment that doesn't, you know, doesn't feel like, okay, we got you where we want you. Now we're going to cram something down your throat, but rather it, it, it sets up a more natural interactivity between people where they can have spiritual conversations. And, uh, and so anyway, so that's, yeah, there, the sky is the limit. Once you start thinking like, again, the ecosystem conversation is, is most churches think about you know, like, okay, we got, you know, we're here to protect this, this little circle of saints, you know, and let's just, let's isolate ourselves from the evil world out there, you know, and, 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 you know, that really doesn't reflect. I mean, Jesus said the gates of hell were not prevail against this church. So in other words, why are we afraid of that evil world out there? Yeah, there's evil stuff out there. Sure. No question about it, but we're not called to, you know, isolate ourselves from that. We're called to be proactively engaged with that to, you know, bring the presence and the power of God into that. And so, you know, the ecosystem is recognizing, wait, we're part of this. Yeah. Like you say, you know, what, how can we engage with the civic 
community around us? How can we engage with other nonprofit organizations? You know, what are the opportunities for us to actually find win-wins uh, with nonprofits, with business, with the entertainment sector? You know, all the sectors of society and culture are part of the ecosystem in which we reside. Instead of, you know, isolating ourselves, pulling into our buildings. I mean, you know, one of the one of the uh, weird things I think that's happened is like some of these really big churches have built, <laughs> they have like an exercise, uh, a gym, you know, yeah. a, 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 gym a gym in their building. In their building you so and I know they're, one they're, <laughs> in Springfield. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the, the idea, idea is, you know, we want you to be able to, as a Christian, we want you to go to a place where you, you're not going to see maybe somebody who's not quite, uh, you, know, you know, properly, they're not modestly they're not dressed, clad. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And you, and you know, you, you won't have to listen to that ungodly rock music. We'll play the Christian rock music, you know, and, and, you know, all the, all, and, and so this idea of let's isolate ourselves from that evil world out there. And sure, are there in a normal gym? Are there scantily clad? Yeah, usually there are scantily clad. And it's like, wait a minute, the Holy Spirit, the power and the presence of God in me is big enough uh, that that I can I I can be in that environment. And and I don't, you know, I need to learn how to manage uh, the, those things. That's part of that's what the Holy Spirit's power is about and for. You know. <laughs> We want to minimize his, the, the need for his power in our lives, right? No, I don't know. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That's, that's, kind of, that's kind of what it is. Like, <laughs> it is like, you, you know, like a good Pharisee. Good enough, so yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. Yeah, we, no, we we, we we we'll just we, we'll, create this big safe place, and you know, yeah, eventually, you know, you have to go out there in the evil world. But most of the time, you can just spend here. You can, you know, get your coffee here, get your this, get your that. Yeah, that's the other thing. Like these coffee shop things. Don't don't start a church coffee shop. Start a really good coffee shop. If you're going to do a coffee shop, yeah, like make the best coffee in town that people want to. And 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 then that becomes a place where you can meet up with people and have conversations and you know, you know whatever. Yeah, whatever. I'm really intrigued by the this partnership, this collaborative idea of uh, like I, I I love capitalism as far as uh, being able to provide goods and services to other people. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. capitalism at times gets a bad rap because just like anything, all models are flawed. Some are useful. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah. and also you, you, you've got these core values and these ethics that people, uh, end up like tripping over or disregarding yeah, completely. Yeah. But, um, this idea, like there's a coffee shop, obviously this is unpaid advertisement for BlackRock, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about like, how could I get BlackRock to partner with our, in our building? Like yeah. they can, yeah. they can run yeah. a coffee yeah. shop for a much cheaper uh, rent in my building right. than they would right. somewhere else. And we can partner together. Yeah. Yeah. You said something, you know, I, I'm really intrigued by helping the city do things, but because I know that you know, they have investment dollars that they're always trying to make the city better mm -hmm. and more, uh, more friendly to business and, uh, business mm -hmm. really helps the city thrive if it's done right. And, yeah, um, yeah. so many times the city doesn't see, uh, the church as a net positive. They see it as a net negative right. because right. they lose tax revenue. They right. lose, right. uh, and we are, uh, we isolate. So we, we're not even helping the city right. from a, from a social standpoint. Um, right, right. So they don't see it in terms of good ROI, return on investment, right? right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Right. And, and so even and and we'll we say this all the time. We're we're for the city, but why not work with the city instead of be for the city? They'll feel right, like right. you're for them if you're with them, <laughs> you know. Right, and so right, right, what right. can we do to really partner with them to do yeah, things yeah. that hey, they're saying this is what we really need, and they have a better pulse, I think, on cities and communities. Than even we do because oh, yeah, that's their yeah. full time job. Well, and you, you know that's that's where it starts. What you just it just they know like where the gaps are. They know they're getting calls and emails and diatribes from people about you know we don't like this and we don't like that. You need to do something about it. So, I mean, all you have to do is talk to a city leader and say you know what are the pain points here, and they're going to tell you. They're going to say whatever it may be, and you know, then, then you can say, okay, let's, 
let's think about how we can. And then you go back to them and say, hey, what if we did this, you know, uh, and maybe it's a horrible idea. And they might say, yeah, that's not really going to help. But maybe it's a great idea. And they go, wow, if you guys did that, that'd be awesome. You know, so the point is, you know, one of the worst things that churches do is we decide what we're, you know, we're isolated. And then we think, oh, what if we do this? And we we just go do something and nobody's helped by it. And it's just irritating. Um, but instead, you know, uh, create a dialogue, listen and listen, 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 listen. Like, like when I'm coaching somebody who's getting ready to start a new church, I say, you know what? Don't even say a word for the first six months except to ask a question. And, and the question would be something like, hey, tell me about why you live here or, you know, why why did you start your business here or why, why are you, you know, a part of this community? Listen, listen, listen. And as you listen, you're going to hear stuff where you realize, wait, that's a place we can add value. Um, and, and the church brings unique value into situations like just one simple example would be, you know, sometimes, you know, cities put on these whatever festivals or something, street festivals, and they spend city money to create a place for people to gather. And, you know, they have vendors and all kinds of, they, they figure out a way to try to make it pay for itself, but it ends up costing them something. And one of the things they often need are people just to do logistical stuff, set up, tear down, you know, whatever. And, and that's just a low bar kind of place where a church might actually say, hey, we've got some volunteers. We'd like to, you know, bring bring people and be involved in that. No, no charge, no deal. We don't have to have our logo plastered all over everything. Um, and so, I mean, that's just a like low bar, simple example, but, but it can go much more um, deliberate and complicated than that as you get to know these, these churches, uh, uh, the, the city things. And this can lead to other stuff. So there's, you know, um, I don't know. Here's just another crazy example of like there was a, a, a friend of mine that he was a business guy and he heard about a girl that I think was 11 years old or something ended up. She um, OD'd on some kind of drug, you know, and and it hit the paper and he read about it. And it was close to where he lived and he lived in kind of a nice community. And he was curious about like, what is going on? I, I don't even know there's a place where something like this could happen. And he, so he drove to the community and it was this little, in the middle of this affluent community was a trailer park <laughs> um, where it was very low income and um, people were just, you know, living on the edge there. And, and it was surrounded by these tall kind of windbreaker trees. So it, it was, you just didn't even see it. You drove yeah, you drove by it all the time, but he had driven by that every day, but he didn't know it was there. So anyway, he so he's a Christian, you know, he's like, well, I, I need to do something, you know, this is tragic that this little girl died. And, and, and he realized part of the reason it happened, well, he wondered why it happened there, even though it's a poor community, it doesn't mean it's necessarily crime infested or whatever. So he got out and started walking around saying to people, uh, hey, I'm... I, I'd like to start a Bible study here. Well, he's wearing his, you know, suit and tie and he's driving his Mercedes or whatever. And they're all looking at him like, who is this white guy with, you know, I mean, he, he's, he's going to take advantage of us. So he realized, okay, these people are scared of me. So he went back and put on regular clothes and took the bus there and walked around and just said, hey, if you could change one thing about this community, what would it be? And the most common answer he got was all the bad stuff. The reason that little girl died was because between about three o'clock in the afternoon to six o'clock uh, in the evening, the kids are here and there's no adults because all the adults are at their jobs and they don't get home from their jobs. So there's this space of time from about three until six when the kids are out of school, but the parents haven't come home yet and the inmates are running the asylum. And so, um, you know, he, they they said if somebody could do something with the kids during that time. So this guy had never started heard of a after school program, but but he talked to some of his friends and and that th that idea. And he said I'm going to start an after school program. So he went to the slum lord who ran the the uh, thing and he said I can make you the hero. At that point, he was in the city's eyes. He was a problem, and they didn't know what to do with him because he was inside the law, but it was just a mess. And so this guy went to him and uh, this uh, business guy went and he said, hey, I can make you a hero in the city, but you got to give me enough room to, to put up a, um, uh, 
like a temporary classroom kind of thing. It was basically another tra- a couple of trailers. You know how they put trailers together. Anyway, bottom line is he got the guy to donate him the land. He got some other people to donate the, the, the buildings that would go on the land. And bada boom, bada bang, uh, he's, he started an after school program. And that a church could do something like that. A church could, could you know, re- rec- discover a need in the community. But you've got to listen to you've got to listen to what the community is concerned about, you know, and that's what this guy did. So, I mean, the sky is the limit. It's like the creativity of the Holy Spirit is what we need is like, Lord, help us to see beyond. And when we're just looking inside in our little Kumbaya club, all we're going to think about is, well, Sister Mary's unhappy about the color of the carpet. And, you know, we get we just get sidetracked by all this silly, stupid stuff that has nothing to do with advancing um, the kingdom of God, you know? Good. All right. So the final thing, as we're starting to wrap up, I, w- I want to yep. talk about, yep. uh, uh, metrics. <laughs> if we're going to do this right, like, uh, the metrics have to change, I'm guessing. And so yeah. obviously yeah. we have a yeah. shift that's shift number eight. What should we be yeah. measuring? Yeah. Then? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah, that's great. yeah, well, you yeah, know, well, the standard, you know, the standard, what is the standard, standard major? I mean, you've been around the church around at all, you know. All. It's Buts, budgets and, and buildings. <laughs> yeah, budget, yeah, budget, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got yeah, three. You got three. That's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's two, it's, or, three. It's two it's, or three. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's noses, it's nickels, butts, budgets, and buildings. Yeah, that's good. And and so here's the thing. Those two metrics, to me, are similar to measuring the health of a car or the functioning of a car by deciding by just you have two dials you've got the speedometer and the fuel tank you know and the speedometer says you're going 80 miles an hour and the fuel tank says you have a full tank of gas so the car is running great right well if you had some other gauges they would tell you the engine fell out five miles ago you're going downhill you have no brakes and you're about to go off a cliff now you're going 80 miles an hour with no brakes and a full tank of gas that's a pretty different picture, you know? So you need more information than those two common things. How many people, and usually what we're asking is, how many people are showing up on Sunday to hear you talk? That's the metric is when somebody says it's a church of 200 or a church of 2000, they're literally talking about what they mean is it's the people who show up and, and sit in the pew or, you know, stand in worship or whatever, they participate to that level. But it's really a pretty, it's a pretty low bar. And, um, you know, and then how much money do they put in the offering, you know, so that that's, and, and, and we determine the health of a church by that. So yeah, what do we need to measure? Well, again, you go back to what Jesus said, which is, go make disciples. So maybe we start there, huh? What if we start by measuring disciples? Now, the problem is, that's a little harder to do, admittedly. It's easy to count how many people in a room. You just have to have somebody, you know, you've been in a church probably and seen somebody walking during the sermon or something. They're walking around and they're counting people. That's pretty easy to do. Um, measuring disciple makers is a lot. It, it's 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 harder, but it can be done. And that means what what I what I'm recommending in the book is that you sort of you sort of break down some of the elements of disciple making so that, and, and define them in ways that are measurable. So I, I think one of the elements of making a disciple is just being friends with people, you know, like being a real friend, whether or not they're following Jesus doesn't really matter. I think that somebody's a disciple, becomes a disciple. You become a disciple maker the minute you encounter somebody who's not following Jesus and you're and you're helping them either, either move toward Jesus or grow with Jesus. And so when you use that definition, having just being a friend with somebody is a, a part of the process of making disciples. And so one metric that we need to start counting is how many friends do we have, especially friends that are not currently following Jesus, you know? And um, so that could be a metric. And how many, what about spiritual conversations, you know, usually out of relational connectivity. uh, I have, a bunch of friends that aren't currently following Jesus, but they know that I'm following Jesus. And, and occasionally in the course of our, um, you know, relational conversations, we'll talk about spiritual things. Well, that's countable, you know? So you start asking yourself, and and the reason you want to measure stuff is because we all know what gets measured gets done, 
you know? And so the old metrics incentivize us to figure out ways to get people to show up to a meeting. If you start measuring relationships and conversations and things like that, that motivates you to have, I, I want to have more relationships. I want to have more conversations. And so it pushes you toward the very stuff that'll very help, stuff you, do that'll help you do said, what Jesus said for us to do for us to do. So good. So good. Well, I appreciate your time. Uh, where can we find you online? Uh, the the best place is to go to nextwave.community. Next, it's just nextwave.community. And people can, um, you know, they can get, if they want to get the book there, they can get the book there. If they want to connect with our, we have an online community called Next Wave Online Community where we're having this conversation 24 uh, seven via the you know the the platform and if people are interested in being part of that conversation they can they can join it there and uh, yeah so that's the best place to go next wave dot community community well definitely pick up the book it is riveting it's a big one but it's a good read it's a really good read you did a great job on it and i know it was thank uh, you. i thank know you. writing is not easy so uh, <laughs> So yeah, um, right. I appreciate right. the time to uh, to hang out with me and talk church. I, like I can nerd out on this stuff all day, but uh, I, I think giving us, uh, especially young professionals that are outside of church leadership, a new yeah. picture of what church could be, like that's super cool, yeah. and I really appreciate that. So thank you for thank awesome. you for your time. Awesome. Hey, thank you for listening to our interview today. We're so excited to be able to bring these to you weekly. If you'd like to stay up to date on our blogs, on our podcasts, even some of our social media, or if you would like to say hi to me, you can reach out to us at 480-531-9015. Again, that's 480-531-9015. We know that when leaders develop fulfillment in their own lives, that they begin to develop fulfillment in others. And when fulfilled leaders lead, they lead and develop hope. And the world needs a lot more hope. So here's the deal. We would love to see you next week and let's lead full together.